This is why I'm not part of this show because I'm not smart enough to understand. <laughs> You're not it just hurt enough. my head. I'm like, no, <laughs> that is so painful. Uh. Welcome once again to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health and Medical Journal Club podcast for anyone who is as confused by the latest health study as I am by why it has been so long since the last time we did a live episode. Why has it been so long, Matt? It's been, I have no idea why, but I can tell you that our last live episode, I think, was back in 2017. Yeah, and we, I, we, we got into an argument on stage. Se- I think several arguments, <laughs> in fact. That is kind of our thing. Yeah, we do that. So we are we are back for a another live episode. This one, of course, is live via Zoom because we uh, we don't get to do live events in COVID times. But I do want to welcome. And we haven't gotten enough haven't gotten enough Zoom either. No, no, clearly not. But but welcome the audience here. I, I am Matt Fox from the Departments of Epidemiology and Global Health, and I am here as always with Dr. Chris Gill from the Department of Global Health. Welcome, Chris. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. We're here to try to take the gloom out of your Zoom. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> and then we have Dr. Don Thea, also from the Department of Global Health. Welcome, Don. Greetings, everybody. And today we have a very special guest, someone we have wanted to have on the podcast probably since day one. We have Sandro Galea, Dean, and Robert A. Knox, Professor of Public Health at the Boston University School of Public Health as our special guest today. Welcome, Sandro. I'm only here so you could introduce me as very special. I appreciate it. <laughs> that just, you, just, you just made my month. I'm, not, I'm done. <laughs> we have never we have never referred to anyone else as a special guest. So uh, please not, it is, uh, it, don't it, listen. Much to, less the very special guest. Exactly. It's exactly. just getting better and better. <laughs> And I want to let everyone know that the reason we are doing this live event, this is part of the BU School of Public Health's SPH 45 Public Health Now is the Time, which is a campaign aimed at elevating the conversation around the public's health. And as always, we do want to remind you to head over to the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthex.org, which is BU's hub for lifelong learning. And remember that we have the Winter Institute coming up soon. That begins in January 2021, and if you are an alum, you get a 25% discount. The events that we are featuring this year are Creating Maximum Value, Lean Management in Healthcare, Essentials of Biostatistics with SAS JMP, From Data to Dashboards, Using Excel to Support Health Program Decisions, and a webinar on Alcohol Policy and COVID. All right, so we are going to get into it, and we're going to do something a little unusual this time. Don is actually going to going to take over the driver's seat, and I get to sit back and relax. So take take it take it away, Don. Oh boy, this is where I get to channel Matt Fox, the man who breaks Twitter on a weekly basis. Uh, okay, guys, let's behave ourselves. Uh, this is live. Uh, Nick can't save us by editing out the bad parts, and the dean's here. Oh, so we have to be careful. Gotta behave. There will there there will be no fun. There will be no fun. There will, there will be no fun. There will be no fun. <laughs> the dean is present. <laughs> That's right. All right, <laughs> on to the show. Uh, today in our first segment, which is our journal club segment, we're going to look at a study on the decreasing mortality from COVID. In the second part of the podcast, the deep dive segment, we're going to answer all of your questions, that I hope, some of which have come in already and some of which you're going to be posting in the QA section. Um, and we'll do our best to answer those hopefully infectious disease related questions because that's the uh, subject of this particular um, podcast. But if you have any questions about bats or bees, we can take those too. Yeah, One of us can. Right. And then in our last segment, which is our amazing and amusing or wild and wacky segment, as it is sometimes referred to, we'll get into some things that make us laugh out loud. All right. For segment one, the Journal Club segment, we're getting into an article that looked at the decreasing mortality in one New York City health catchment area during the early months of the outbreak there. It was published in the Journal of Hospital Medicine, and the title was Trends in COVID-19 Risk-Adjusted Mortality Rates by the first author, Leora Horowitz of the Center for Healthcare Innovation and Delivery Science, NYU Langone Health Center in New York. This one got a lot of attention because it was really good news, but also because everyone wanted to know if it was related to reduced mortality or differences in age distributions as the pandemic matured through the New York City area. Some of the headlines 
that were reported were in uh, U.S. News and World Report, death rates are dropping for New Yorkers with COVID-19. Why? New York Times had death rates have dropped for seriously ill COVID patients. People magazine reported COVID death rates are down as doctors learn how to treat the virus, but it could still be deadly. Popular Science said we're getting better at treating COVID-19. All right. So, Matt, let me start with you and have you summarize the paper for us and give us a, a encapsulated idea of what these people did. All right. A lot of pressure. This is my, my first time doing the summary. So I got big shoes to fill here. But <laughs> I, this was a this was a this is a paper that I chose. And the reason that I chose this and I know it confused Chris at first as to why I chose it, because this is actually worth noting. It's a it's a short research paper. It was not a, a, a full research article like we're we're used to doing it. But the reason that I was so interested in this one is because it got so much attention. This one was, you know, I'm at home way more than I'm used to. And the election season was upon us. So I was watching cable news way more than I'm used to. And so the first author of this study was on all of the the, the major networks, I believe, talking about this study. So they, they had her on. And so it really interested me to understand why. And the, the basic idea is that, you know, we all know that in the very beginning days of, of COVID, there was really high mortality associated with the with the virus. And yet they have been dropping ever since. And the question is why? So the, the CDC data says that about 6.7% of cases resulted in death in April, but that dropped down to about 1.9% in September. But we also know that other things have been changing during that same time. So patients are getting younger and they have fewer comorbidities. So nationally, the, the median age of confirmed cases was 38 at the end of August, down from 46 at the start of, of May. So a lot has been changing and no one really knows whether the reason why things are getting better is because the, the patients are just healthier or because treatment is getting better. And so what they did was they looked at hospital mortality in a, as Don says, like a cohort of, of patients at a three hospital academic health system in New York. So this was a cohort study. I would define this as a prospective cohort study. I think others might say it's retrospective, but we can we can get into that and debate it. But they, they analyzed mortality rates for admissions between March 1st and August 31st of 2020, again, in this single health system in New York City. And then they followed people up through at least October, or, or a maximum, I should say, of October 8th of 2020. And they pulled all the data from an electronic health record system. And essentially, their exposure was time. They were trying to understand whether the mortality rates were changing over time, adjusting for the changes in the patient population. So they were able to adjust for comorbidities, vital signs, lab results, all kinds of things. So they included all hospitalizations of people 18 years or older with laboratory confirmed SARS-CoV-2 identified during hospitalization or in the prior two weeks. They left out patients who were admitted to hospice care and they did allow people to be hospitalized more than once, although it only happened a limited number of times. They excluded patients without vital signs. And their primary outcome was in hospital mortality or discharge to hospice. So essentially, are people surviving the disease? So then they were essentially fit a, a logistic regression model for for that outcome, mortality or, or discharge to hospice, adjusting for a whole bunch of things that they had from the medical record that they felt were potential confounders. So age, sex, self-reported race and ethnicity, BMI, smoking history, presence of hypertension, heart failure, hyperlipidemia, coronary artery disease, diabetes, cancer, chronic kidney disease, dementia, pulmonary disease, oxygen saturation, et cetera, et cetera. And I only go through that whole list to point out that while we may get into a discussion of whether or not there was confounding, they actually did have a lot of information to adjust for. And then they basically fit two different kinds of models, one in which they adjusted for time and one in which they didn't so that they could sort of look for the, the general predictors and then whether or not things were changing over time. So in terms of what they found, they had a little over 5,000 hospitalizations and hospitalizations peaked in late March to mid-April. And so in that period, there were, it was about 53% of the total hospitalizations. 
the median length of stay for patients who died or were discharged to hospice was, was eight days with an interquartile range of four to 15 days. But the key finding here is that if you just look at the crude numbers, mortality dropped from 24.9% in March to 3.7% in August. So first of all, 25% is, is staggering, but that number went way, way down by August. Now that's just the crude comparison, but the median age and the percent male or without any comorbidity was also decreasing over time, as we had alluded to in the introduction. So for example, the proportion with any chronic condition decreased from 81% in March to 72% in August. The median age dropped from 63 in March to 46 in August, and the percent male dropped from 62% in March to 64% in August, and all of those are risk factors for severe disease. But it's also worth noting that the number of cases dropped substantially over that period of time. So there were 1,700 admissions in March that went up to 2,300 in April, but that was that went down to only 134 in August. So, you know, one possibility is that there's something going on just around the ability to manage. But then they did their adjusted analysis and they found that in the adjusted mortality, mortality dropped from 25.6% in March to 7.6% in August. So even after accounting for all of those things, mortality is dropping substantially. And if you put that into their, their sort of uh, average marginal effects model, it was about an 18.2 percentage point drop in August comparing to March. So again, you know, if, if you take the data at face value, pretty strong evidence that things are getting better over time. A little bit of a question as to exactly what's going on, but their conclusion is that this is a substantial drop even after accounting for changing patient demographics and characteristics, and therefore it is presumably largely attributable to improved care. Excellent summary. You filled those shoes very well, oh. Matt. Just one point of clarification. You said that those who were admitted into hospice care were excluded from the study, which is true, but being discharged to hospice was uh, regarded as being equivalent to death, and that was part of the outcome definition. So it's important just, just to sort of make that distinction. Yep. Sandro, let me, let me throw it to you. What are your thoughts? Good, bad, Convincing, unconvincing. So, so yes. Yeah, so, 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 actually, I have a question. So, oh. supposing we were living in the pandemic of a century, and you know we're going through a whole year with uh, you know seeing cases scaring us all, changing changing our way of life, right? And anybody who is not an epidemiologist looking at the curves, and anybody crudely can tell that cases in the second wave nationally are going up, but mortality is going down. This is widely available information on the front page of New York Times every single day. Anybody really could have seen that cases, that the death per cases was down by about a factor of four. So anybody could see that. So an educated reader observer paying attention, which is roughly 300 million Americans, would be saying, well, I really want a paper that actually analyzes this and tells me what's going on. Now, that paper happens and is published in a journal with an impact factor of two. At a moment in time when... All sorts of things are getting published in, uh, in, uh, in medical journals with uh, much higher impact factors, when in fact about 10% of all medical publishing right now is about COVID. So my question is, why is this paper, which I would argue should have been much more eagerly anticipated than any number of thousands of other papers, as evidenced, by the way, by what Matt said at the beginning, the, the media attention to it, why was this paper in a journal with an impact factor of two? <laughs> yeah. Can I take a stab at that? Sure, Chris. <laughs> or is this rhetorical? No, no, no. I'm actually, I, I, I actually want you, you all to educate me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, well, I, I, I doubt, I doubt very much I could do that. So, you know, Matt, you, you, you led with an absolute risk reduction, which, which you always do mm -hmm. because you want to sort of like, you know, paint the, you know, the actual rate. So we went from a 25% mortality rate to about a five percent or so three percent uh, yeah. seven percent whatever it was some very small number so a fantastic reduction in mortality not a little bit like an enormous yes, huge. reduction in mortality and so that is remarkable and this is one of those things i think where you say it's so remarkable that you'd like to have remarkable evidence to explain it as being anything other than case mix mm -hmm. which is which i assume is the is the is the true answer here that this is all about 
you know, the fact that back in March, we were admitting many sicker patients than we were in August. And that accounts for almost the entire effect. Because in parallel with this, we we have certainly had you know, changes in, in our, our medical tools. We know that proning helps. We know that heparin helps. We know that dexamethasone helps. And we think remdesivir helps. We think interleukin-1 inhibitors help. And we think interleukin-6 inhibitors don't help. I think the but jury's still out the, on some of those. Me this, too. And maybe that's me right. Me too. Right. So even, even, but I th- actually, that's even strengthening my point, which is that the, the advances in medical care have not been astonishing. Uh, to account for this astonishing finding. So dexamethasone, for example, had a relative risk reduction of 60% in mortality, which is pretty darn good, let's say, for, for a medical intervention for a single drug, especially one so cheap. Mm-hmm. So, you know, all of those things helped, but they don't get you an 18% absolute risk reduction. It just ain't possible. So then another question is, could it be that the virus has gone from being a tiger to a pussycat? And the virologists have said, no, it is not mutating to become a less virulent organism. So that's off the table. And then, Don, you had mentioned in our pre-discussions that maybe this is because the, you know, the resource capacity of these hospital systems were simply overwhelmed in New York. And so, you know, even the provision of routine care was impaired because, the, you know, the hospitals were just, you know, inundated with patients and they couldn't manage. And that probably accounts for this, too. But even if you add up all these things in sort of a qualitative way, I still don't see an 18% risk reduction. What I see is a paper that did not adjust for case severity, but only adjusted for risk factors. And, and I think that that is the, the big sort of hole in the argument here that this, you know, I, I, I just fundamentally think that that is, that is much more likely to explain this. And that's probably why the New England Journal of Medicine or the Lancet didn't pick this up and say, yes, there's been this fantastic result, because the more likely explanation is this is all due to hidden confounding. But but Chris, you don't you don't think that that there's a qualitative difference. You're you're, you're making the argument that the that the difference is not as great as the paper purports it to be, but you're not questioning the qual the qualitative nature of the of the data that in fact there was a change in mortality over some period of time. No, I'm sure the that the mortality went down. I have no doubt that that is the case. I just don't think it was because of a change, like because we got so much better at managing the disease or because the virus itself becomes so much less aggressive. I don't think either of those are the cases. I think what we're probably looking at is that in March, when testing capacity was still quite limited, we were admitting patients, you know, aggressively with COVID-19, you know, you know, who were very, very, very sick. Um, And so we were looking at a different a different spectrum of the disease on so average. So you're really and arguing that, with their interpretation. You're not arguing with their methods. All you're saying is that in the paragraph where they say, here's why we think this is what it is, that they actually should have mentioned case case mix. That's what you're saying. Yes, that's exactly so, so, right. So, so, but but, but, but uh, that doesn't answer my question. The, the, the fact that they missed adding case mix, and let's say you might, let's say you might be right. I'm not sure you are, but let's say you, you might be right. That, that not listing that as an explanation that to me does not explain why this paper, which undoubtedly went through another five higher impact uh, journal, uh, mm-hmm. journals, right. ended up in this in, in, in this journal. So I'm actually asking you all, what is the flaw in this paper? Like, like what's the flaw that landed it in this journal? Well, I, I'm not going to answer that so much as I'm going to go back to Chris and challenge him a little bit here based mm-hmm. on your question, because I, I agree with you, Chris. I There is something here that's missing, and I, I had the same reaction. Why is this... Why was this article in a journal that, you know, I, I, I'd never heard of? It's not my field to have heard of this particular journal, but I've, I've never heard of this journal. And this is the kind of thing that I would expect to be in, you know, a really high impact Correct. journal. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. the reason I went through in detail what they adjusted for is that it strikes me that those things that they have adjusted for, while I would certainly agree with you, don't cover necessarily everything that you'd want to adjust for if you were trying to really equalize out whether or not this is this is treatment. Still, those things should be reasonably well correlated with, you know, with 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 case severity, that we should have seen something change in the adjusted mm. analysis. And and it, there was very little change. And you know, one of the things that this paper is missing is is any information on the the quality of the the variables that they were adjusted for and any missing data we just don't we just don't know that but right. I, I I wonder about it I mean the only clinical data that they provided that was sort of like you know the, the sort of a proxy for for disease severity were D dimers 
and CRP, CRP levels. So very nonspecific markers of inflammatory processes. And in the case of D-dimers, maybe that there's some sort of, you know, sepsis-like syndrome going on. That was it. And that, that is not an Apache score. I'm sorry. That doesn't cut it in my view. You know, so if you, if you were, if you were doing a, a sepsis study in the ICU, looking at factors associated with sepsis mortality, you would adjust for case severity using the Apache system, which is very complicated and looks at, you know, kidney function and liver function, and heart function and blood pressure and respiratory you know, oxygen saturations, you adjust for all of those variables to try to come up with a composite measure of how sick this person was, rather than just saying diabetic yes, diabetic no, which, you know, is a demographic risk factor, but tells you nothing about how sick the person was when they walked in, well, probably were wheeled in on a gurney, uh, you know, into the hospital. And I think that to me is the, is the flaw here. Along those lines also, I think that one piece of information that we, we don't really get a, a good sense of is the frailty of the population. We know that this epidemic just ran right through the population of people who were in nursing homes and in assisted care, and, and they mm-hmm. have an extremely high mortality. You can make the argument that those those individuals also had the comorbidities, which would be kind of an indication – that would be parallel to that, and we have that information in this in this paper. But I would like to know, you know, to, to what extent some measure of the frailty of the population that were enrolled in this study early on in comparison to, to later on, because I think what happened was that it's a horrible thought, but the but the very very susceptible population kind of got exhausted early in the epidemic in mm-hmm. New York City, and that may also mm-hmm. account for why you're seeing such a high mortality rate in. March and April. So that's a that's 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 adjacent to crisis. It's it's not particularly. It's not different. It's not a completely different. Right. It's a case severity frailty. What you're both saying is that is that fundamentally the people presenting to hospital were different in in April than they were in August. Right. That's what what you're both saying. So I come back to this question, which I would argue it's an important question that mortality has dropped dramatically and we don't understand why it is. The virologists, as Chris keeps saying, keep being party poopers and keep saying, no, no, the virus is not changing for the better, to which anybody looking at the front page of paper keeps saying, but how is that possible? This paper comes along, tries to show us that, adjusts for a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, it doesn't adjust for frailty and it doesn't adjust for case presentation. Fine. So there could be two words in the discussion. Why is it that it didn't, that when it went to higher impact journals, Somebody didn't say, just say that and say that that's, some, that's a possible explanation. But, and, and I'm asking, actually, because I can figure it out. I actually cannot figure this out, why this paper, which got a lot of media attention, didn't have more scientific attention. To my, to, in my read, I was actually delighted that you chose this paper, Matt. This is the paper with the biggest dissonance between its media footprint and its academic footprint. And I can't for mm-hmm. the life of me figure out why that is. I, I so uh, don't you think that it's just journal editors who had this same level of skepticism that the analysis is, is presenting a story that's too good to be true, and so that they don't really want to touch this. They they don't basically trust the analysis, and even putting in a disclaimer in the discussion saying our results could be completely wrong because we didn't adjust for case severity is is not doesn't solve the problem the, the underlying structural problem with the paper. The standard I always hold papers to is could I have done better. <laughs> Yeah. I always ask that. And I don't know that I could yeah. have. Now, I may, I'm, I know maybe I'm, I'm, I'm revealing weakness here on something that's being recorded. <laughs> but I look at this and I'm like, you know, I probably could have had a few more disclaimers in the discussion. Sure. But I look at this paper, I think for what it is, 5,000 people, large system, this paper does a great job. And by the way, we should, we should note that there have been no other papers like it. Now, there are many other large systems. Nobody's actually done a better paper. It's not like there's mm-hmm. a, 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 this is the first of its kind. So what are we worried about saying this? Now, just to be provocative, are we afraid that it goes against our doom and gloom, fear fear of everything COVID narrative? <laughs> like, like this is a paper that pushes against it. Could this potentially be going against that bias? I'm just speculating. Mm, I'm not convinced about that. I mean, it's it's an interesting idea, but I'm not convinced that, that the reason is that it goes against the doom and gloom narrative because I don't think... At least the, the you know those of us you know on this in this conversation are disputing that that things things got better. We're simply disputing the why did things get better, and that I don't think goes you know goes strictly against that that narrative. Fair. No, that's fair. That's 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 a, that's a fair that, that's a fair point. You know, we publish things all the time, right, without understanding mm-hmm. them, and, and the, so this paper does that and says there's a whole bunch of things we didn't understand. So, so I went when I went through it carefully. I was trying to think of well, what else should they have done? Now I hadn't thought of the the sort of frailty case presentation. 
that's fine. I, I, I buy that. That, that, that. that seems compelling. Beside that, though, it's a very straightforward analysis. In some respects, it's a perfect analysis for a general medical journal because mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's a fairly thin analysis, which is typical for a general medical journal. So, so I'm trying to think through what did the reviewer say that I'm not seeing? I don't know the answer to that, but the one thing that I I was thinking to myself, you would you'd want to add here is if you really want to know whether or not it's this is this is treatment related, you would have collected good data on what treatments on were treatment, being on used, and Correct. presumably they didn't do that because they 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 were not planning this study prospectively. It, it they had the ability to do it after the fact, but I'm not sure. You know, I think the other thing that would that would have been really helpful to to know about is. You know, Matt, Matt went through the number of enrollments oh, yeah. that were very, very high in March and then even higher in April and then dropped precipitously. And and most of the mortality is in March and April. We don't know what the surge capacity was. I mean, we, right. we all were kind of glued to the TV and glued to the newspaper and would watch these horror stories and these these sirens going all hours of the night and, and could only imagine what our colleagues in New York were, 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 were dealing with. And it, it's entirely plausible that the capacity was exceeded just in, by the sheer numbers of people who who deluged these 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 rooms, and so even the hardy and the and the less frail early on suffered you know mortal events because of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can I ask can I ask a related question, but slightly different? So I thought there was a line which uh, which was sort of tucked away in the paper, which says that the difference, the decrease in mortality was observed across age groups. Then they tucked it into Appendix C. Which I actually thought that was quite important. It was quite important that the decrease in mortality is observed across age groups because it says, at a very simple level, that uh, that age mix is not a particularly dominant explanation. Which, if you think about it, before this paper, the the, the conversation in the media was certainly well, it's age mix, uh, but that suggests it's not age mix. So I'm curious why that wasn't more prominent here, and what you all made of that. Thinking about this frailty worst cases mm-hmm. hypothesis that Chris and Don have uh, proposed? Well, I would assume that in the in the same way that we've seen this gradient of higher mortality in men than in women, that we're seeing this gradient in, in you know, of mortality as a function of age, that both of those are proxies for underlying unrecognized risk factors, that it's not age per se, that it's not right. the, the sex of the individual per se, it's that men have a higher incidence of undiagnosed cardiovascular disease. Mm. And, and that really, that's what we're looking at. It's probably not testosterone or estrogen that's driving it. It's probably you know the underlying undiagnosed risk factors. And, and actually, there have been some analyses that show that to be true. Mm-hmm. That when you you know, you know you you do a deep dive and figure out how many of them actually have diabetes and hypertension, et cetera, when you you make that argument clear, then the effect of sex seems to go away, and and I, I imagine it's probably the same phenomenon with with age that it's really just a proxy for underlying risk factors that have not been identified. So if we were to go if we were to go with your theory, Chris, I'm in agreement with everything you said. That that part of what's going on here is a different presentation, different severity presentation, right? But the reduction in mortality was, they say, uniform across age groups. Do we think that the severity presentation in the 30-year-olds was substantially different in, in March than it was in August? I actually, uh, I think that leads to a question that just popped up in the, in the Q&A about this very discussion by Bev Brown, who asks, what role did silent hypoxia, undetected, in the early stages play in changing mortality? Do people come to the hospital earlier now? Mm-hmm. I think that that could, that could relate to what you were just saying, Sandra. And, and we did not recognize that. You know, there's all, the, all these depictions of people being happy hypoxemics. They're in, mm-hmm. you know, they're sitting in the, in, the, in the emergency room and they've got a high, uh, uh, an O2 saturation of 92 or 88, and they're talking on their telephone, cell phone, and they're, mm-hmm. they seem to be perfectly happy, and then they fall mm-hmm. off a cliff. And I think that that was probably unrecognized early on, and that speaks to, I think, something, some of the things that you were saying, Sandra. It also, it also suggests that they're not wrong. The treatment improvements have actually have played a really big role. Now, uh, look, I'm, I'm not very eager to, to acknowledge that it's all about treatment, because uh, that sort of runs against a lot of my, my sort of philosophical architecture. But I, I was pretty convinced when I read this paper that this was largely about treatment, that that's what the differences were seeing. Mm. I, I want to challenge that a little bit because the, the timing of all of this is a little bit suspect in my view. You know, the, the seminal 
dexamethasone reduces mortality paper was not published until late July. And so we're looking at the last month in this series. And so it's coming a little bit late for that to be sort of, you know, I mean, I assume people were using dexamethasone even before the evidence was clear. But but the, the, the change, so like the standard of care had not yet shifted. And that's true of also the, the high mortality rates that we're seeing in March and April and May when, you know, even then remdesivir was in an extremely short supply and people were still figuring out mm-hmm. that heparin may have an advantage and that proning patients on events may have had an advantage. This is all too soon. But then if you look at the like the median ages at, at you know within each of these monthly strata, you see it drop from the mid 60s back in March and April down to 49 in August. And so the the, the spectrum of individuals who are are dying or who are who are being seen here is has shifted by two decades in four months. And and so again that that feels like case mix to me rather than it feels like a like a change in medical you know care which did improve evidently I mean I'm, I'm sure it did I would be you know not surprised to see that it, it reduced mortality by half it's just that we're looking at a ninety percent reduction right. in mortality and that 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 that's where it it seems that we have to look elsewhere for an explanation. All right, folks, I think we may have done this death paper to death to a certain extent. So it's time to move on to, to segment two, which is the question and answer segment. And I encourage our listeners to put questions in the Q&A box down below. But we did get a couple of questions prior to our going live. And so I thought we could go through through them. There's a question here from a, uh, an alum from Sri Lanka, and the question is, is there a possibility that burying COVID-19 victims can lead to groundwater contamination and spread of infection? First part, are you aware of any research studies that have looked into this? Sri Lanka requires all COVID-19 victims to be cremated due to concerns that burial will lead to groundwater contamination. This rule has been enforced from very early on in the pandemic and has caused great distress in the minority Muslim community in particular. The health authorities still refuse to allow burials. Matt, why don't you take a crack at that? No. I'm the worst person to answer no. that. <laughs> All right, then. Sandro. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I was actually waiting for Matt's oh, answer. No, that's, no, that's no, no, a but, but, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean <laughs> let me just say one thing about it. And, and I'm sure Chris, Chris actually has an answer. But, you know, I, I do worry about... Uh, uh, about things like this that have happened in COVID in countries all over the world, right? That that, uh, that relatively arbitrary decisions have been mm-hmm. made that are that, that have come from a place of fear that, that that are fundamentally at odds with values that people hold mm-hmm. really dearly. And, mm-hmm. and I mean, hearing this, I, I was not aware about this, this was Sri Lanka. Hearing this, it, it strikes me as, as as one of those examples. And and I, I tend to think of these things. These are not things that are done with malintent. I don't think it, it, the, the the original impetus comes from fear and from a place of trying to protect ourselves, but Time as time passes, I really hope that we nationally and globally have the wisdom to to look at these and say, look, this is causing distress for a particular population. Are we really achieving anything by it? the distress? Probably vastly outweighs the, the the advantage that we're gaining, which, as far as I know, is relatively minimal. But Chris, you, go ahead. Well, I mean, I the, the short answer to the petitioner's question is I don't think there's any data about this whatsoever, but. There is certainly no epidemiologic evidence that transmissions are happening because of contaminated groundwater, nor is there evidence that COVID spreads through contaminated water full stop. So it seems to me exceedingly unlikely that this would be a, a, an issue. And part of the answer is that we know that, that RNA viruses are not particularly hardy and will degenerate very quickly. Uh, and so, the you know, the... the you know, the context in which a body is interred in the ground is really not conducive to causing infections of any kind. And I, and I would add to that, that there are many examples of infectious diseases where the pathogen could, in theory, be much more resistant to the environment and, you know, persist in the environment. And we do not see evidence that those individuals, you know, that burial of those individuals who have those conditions continues to infectious disease outbreaks either. So I, I, I think this one, we can be put to rest. And I think Sandra's points are much more important that this, this is a, you know, this was a, a policy enacted out of an abundance of caution, but now we have more evidence and we should re-examine the policy just in the same way we say, why should it be a six, six foot exclusion zone uh, as the safe zone, as opposed to what they do in Germany, which is three foot. Both of them are arbitrary based on actually no evidence. So we, we pick numbers and we make policy around them, but, you know, we should adapt. Yeah, to, uh, and, 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 and arguably, just, just to, sorry, just to add to what Chris just said, you know, some policies which are arbitrary, ultimately, they, they're low cost, three foot, six foot, four feet. 
Okay, I mean, they, they, have some, they have some practical implications, but it doesn't really matter. But I think a policy like this one, which is now meaning that an, an, that a gr- an entire group that actually feels very strongly about its, bur- its burial rights is being denied those burial rights, that matters much more than whether we choose three, four, five, or six feet. That's yeah, right. just, to, just to put specifics on what Chris was saying, we know that polio can be transmitted in, in sewage. We, we are not aware that polio can be transmitted through contamination of, of groundwater through burials. Same thing with uh, hepatitis A. I just happened to um, look up the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, and they actually have a little flyer on this hmm. very on this very topic. And uh, considerations related to the safe handling of bodies and deceased persons with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. And they state in here that there is no evidence to support this fear. So science still needs to be done. But I think for now, we can say that it's the lack of evidence is not supportive of, 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 the, of the kinds of concerns, but the concerns are real, as Sandra has said. All right, let me jump to the next question. What similarities or differences do you see in this pandemic to other pandemics in the past? Hmm. Well, let me let me start that one just by simply adding on to the previous question, which is I wonder if part of the reason why people were concerned about that particular issue relates to the fact that one of the most recent examples of a pandemic we were worried about, a pandemic that didn't really happen, was Ebola, where there were certainly concerns about transmission during burial services, not necessarily through contaminated groundwater. And I wonder if you know, people, what people learn from fears of, of infectious diseases is very difficult to, to make very specific to, you know, the, the actual conditions that you're in when you just don't know the answers. Yeah, I mean, I think that the other the other pandemic that we had a little bit experience, well, we didn't have experience with, but the world had experience was SARS-CoV-1. And the, the virus is a little bit different. It's a little bit less infectious and it doesn't have this very robust pre-symptomatic infectious period. And it was caught early. So it could have developed into something approaching as bad as this, but it didn't. And and interestingly, I, I teach a class on control of infectious diseases. And one of the first assignments I gave to them was to pick a, a country where the response was good and a country where the response was bad. And it was remarkable the number of students who chose the United States as the bad example. Oh. And, and the oh, number dear. of students who chose those countries that really ha- had very, very uh, profound experiences with SARS-CoV-1, so Hong Kong and Taiwan and South Korea, who have all done it right. So, you know, we didn't, they did learn the lessons from the original pandemic. And if we, the rest of the world had had similar experiences, maybe we wouldn't be in the, in the situation that we're in. Mm-hmm. All right, next question. What do you each think are important lessons or tools we could have applied from previous pandemics to have reduced the spread effect of the COVID pandemic initially? That is a conversation that I think could last for a really long time because this is this could easily be a 150-page case study on what not to do or how not to do it. But Chris, do you want to just to take a quick crack at one or two? Yes. Uh, I mean, we've talked about this in, in previous episodes, too, and I've expressed my frustration about the mask policy, because I, I really feel that we, we, you know, we got this wrong. There, there may have been reasons why we got it wrong. And initially, one of them was that masks and personal protective gear were in short supply. And so we had to, you know, we had to, to, to triage those for the first responders. Okay, so we put that aside as a reason, but it went beyond that to saying that masks do not work. And yet there was a lot of data that came out of SARS-1 back in 2003 and 2004 showing that masks did work. And they worked in both directions for prevention of acquisition and also prevention of, you know, reduction of, of source spread. And so it was not the case that we had an absence of evidence that masks were effective. We knew very well that they had worked well in a very similar virus a decade ago. And and and, and the messaging really went counter to that. And I and I I feel a little bit bitter about that, because it seems to me that this was not our finest hour in terms of, of, of advising the population. And in fact, it led to a lot of sort of mistrust when we, you know, flipped around and said, oh, yes, we're wrong. Masks, you know, we should be doing that. Because masks, you know, are, you know, surgical masks may have been very hard to obtain at the time, but we could have you know, encourage people to make their own masks, which is what my mother-in-law did, you know, at the beginning. And, and you know, those masks actually turned out to be perfectly fine masks. And, and even if they're not perfect masks, they, you know, it is clear that any mask is better than no mask and better masks are better than worse masks. So we could have 
done that. And instead, what we focused on was hand hygiene, which has turned out to be almost completely irrelevant for, for COVID-19. And, and again, the messaging there was odd because, you know, we talk about the importance of hand hygiene for respiratory diseases ad nauseum, but there is in fact very little evidence that hand hygiene matters for respiratory diseases, for most respiratory diseases. And so, you know, yes, you know, the hand hygiene recommendations were done out of an abundance of caution and because there's not a huge opportunistic cost. Fine. But why would we not apply that exact same logic to considering whether the, you know, this disease was spread by aerosols and apply an abundance of the caution and say, until we know better, wear a mask. And yet we didn't. And so it feels like there was a, a massive sort of disconnect there in terms of how we approached this from a public health <laughs> recommendation standpoint. Let's, let's move to the next question, which is directed at you, Dean Galea. It says, I have a question for Dean Galea. I am guessing that it was not on your 2020 to-do list or even your life to-do list to lead a school through a once-in-a-lifetime global pandemic. <laughs> what has been the hardest part of that? And also, what has been an unexpected positive part? Good question. Yeah, great question. Jamie Gratis. Well, I don't know who that Jamie is. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> he knows to put you on the is. spot, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think the, the hardest thing is, is very straightforward. It's, um, no, no, it was absolutely not on my life or 2020 list at all. And I would li like not to go through it at all. I, I think anybody who has any leadership position in of any scale, it, who takes it seriously, you feel very strongly the responsibility to keep the community safe and whole. And the hardest part about it is the threat to that and uh, in terms of physical safety, in terms of economic safety. And it is, it, it is a horrific feeling to know that there are forces around you that are threatening that, that threaten people's livelihoods, that threaten people's health. And, you know, the metaphor that I've used time and again is one of a ship going through the storm. And uh, as a, if I may use a captain of a ship metaphor, I think I would feel the same way with, you know, I'm doing everything I possibly can and my crew is doing everything they possibly can, but the storm may still overwhelm us. And that's a, that's a terrible feeling because, you know, in, in that position, I think if you're doing it right, you feel it deeply and personally that you, above all else, miles above all else, you want to protect the community. So that's the hard part. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of positives, I think it's a, there are a lot of positives and, and I actually... I'm hoping there will be positives years hence. But uh, I, I think perhaps the, the, the biggest positive at this moment in time, and, and I think this comes from an enormous privilege of being in a school, is the chance to learn. It's a chance to learn about, about a virus, about the world around us, about yourself, about the people around you. The, the, I, I've become utterly convinced that uh, an, an event like this, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, create character, right? it just reveals it. It doesn't create things, it reveals what we are. No, but that opportunity to see these things, opportunity to see, is really rare. We actually, you know, we're often muddied by the fog of the everyday. And that's a really unique opportunity. So uh, I, we, for better or for worse, and a lot of it's for worse, we are in an interesting time. Mm. Yeah, I got to say, teaching this class on uh, elimination and control of infectious diseases, it, it is, I, I've taught it every semester for quite a long time. And to, to, to be living through it and to be seeing it unfold in real time, as opposed to being just this abstract concept, adds a, a, a certain quality of reality to the experience in the in the, well, at least on, on the, in the Zoom classroom, which I find really both compelling, scary, but thoroughly unique. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is, uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and to tie it into, back to the sort of leadership institution, I think I would feel, I, I feel heartened by being in an institution of learning going through this. Like, I think I would feel quite differently, actually, if I was, I don't know, running a bank. It's a, our job is to learn and to teach, right? And uh, to go through a moment then when we are learning so much, we're so much opportunity for teaching, that's pretty cool, right? Like if, if, if I can get over the first part, which I, which I mentioned, which dominates my every waking minute, right. I think the rest is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. All right. So let us now turn to the last segment, the wild and wacky or no. amazing and amusing Thank segment. you. And I'm going to take speaker's prerogative and go first. And it was a tough choice because I had a number of papers that I wanted to present. The, the one that I may save for later on is apparently there are certain characteristics of human eyebrows that allow you to discern whether the eyebrow wearer happens to be a malignant narcissist or not. 
Oh, but we won't go there this time. <laughs> but what I wanted to do was to talk just very briefly, talk about a paper that appeared in BMJ in 1995, and apparently reports on a series of ex- an experiment that came out of a collection in July of 1993, where 19 members of the Southeast Thames faculty of the Royal College of General Practitioners gathered at Poor Place in Kent to consider how best to encourage ordinary general practitioners to carry out research. And they kicked around a bunch of ideas, and they came up with this consensus observation that they seemed to be observing the fact that older men had larger ears. Mm -hmm. So what they did is they conducted a series of several hundred observations of men in their practice, and they report that every man that they approached to participate in this program was tickled and absolutely loved the idea of be of having the length of their ears measured. And this kind of goes to some of the research that you're currently doing, Chris. So I've kind of picked this for you because you're doing ear research. But the bottom line is this is the graph that they came up with. And they found that there was actually quite a good correlation. The x-axis is the age of the men and the y-axis is the length of the ear. Okay. And, so their and conclusion for, for our is, audience who, who is not be able to see this, describe it. So what this is, is this is this is a scatter plot with a line that increases. It's a regression line that increases with the age of the man in terms of the length of the year. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be some phenomenon going on here, where as we age, our ears appear to be getting. So, but 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 why 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 (laughs) why are our ears? So so does the fact that we could don't fully understand why I mean it should be published in a, yes. a low-impact factor journal? Absolutely. It was a, it was a BMJ. <laughs> <laughs> it, see, this paper, BMJ. This paper was in the BMJ. Well, the paper we're discussing was in... No, but Sandro... I, I rest but, my no, case. But Sandra, this, is this, is, this is the BMJ <laughs> Christmas edition, which is well known. Uh, <laughs> oh, that is, that is a life aspiration. Yes, I know. Absolutely. Like an Nick Noble Award, right? Exactly. <laughs> if you could send me that paper, Doc, I, I think we might need to cite that. <laughs> yeah, they didn't measure width or depth, just length. Just length. Oh, well, right. I mean, the, 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 the wisdom that we had acquired was that the fleshy part is what elongates, but the cartilaginous part is pretty static. Oh, so sort uh, of gravity so I'm curious effect. whether they actually looked at that, you know, the dangly <laughs> bit. Yeah. You know, All right, Matt, what did fantastic. you go? All right, so I'm, I'm going back to a well that I have gone to once before. In the sense that this is this is going to echo something that I did before. And the reason why I was so excited to do it again, essentially, is because it echoes something that I did on our last live event. And this was totally coincidental. But once I found it, I knew this had to be my amazing and amusing for this time. So this was a um, it was put out in a tweet by Martin Van Smeden, who's a, a great follow on Twitter for all things misclassification and, and epi methods. And... Martin published a tweet in which he gave a a screenshot of his new paper. The title of the paper is Things That Cannot Be Published as a Preprint, A Hitchhiker's Guide. He is the sole author on this paper. And it was published in the Journal of Important Science Things, which is to say (laughs) it was not actually published, but... He put it out there, it, and it looks, you know, I mean, it's it's set up like a like a, a, a real paper. And I'm going to read you the abstract. It says, preprints are an efficient way of communicating scientific results to the other scientists and public faster, cheaper, and without paywalls. Now that preprinting of research articles before peer review has become the new normal, the question arises, what are the barriers that prevent a scientist from publishing a preprint of an article? In this article, I describe a complete list of things that cannot be published as a preprint. This work has important implications that are immediately obvious to the reader. I'm now going to read you the paper. The paper says, a complete list of things that cannot be published as a preprint. Nothing. (laughs) That is the paper. (laughs) Isn't that one of those logical, uh, like, uh, paradoxes? Yes. Yes. Anyway. This is why I'm not part of this show, because I'm not smart enough to understand. <laughs> You're not deranged enough. That just enough. hurt my head. I'm like, whoa, that is so painful. Uh, I just like that the, I don't think the abstract is longer than the entire article. That's what I want to yeah. publish someday. All right, Chris, it's yours. All right, well, 
I'm going to I'm going to talk about something that has precisely nothing to do with science or public health whatsoever. But I but it, it amuses me so much that I wanted to I wanted to take the opportunity to talk about it anyway, because we have just gone through what I would call a titanic battle of, of mega egos, i.e. the U.S. presidential election. And I, I, I want to comment on a an upcoming anniversary of a titanic ego which will be on december 17th of this month and for those of you who don't recognize that date it is beethoven's birthday mm. uh, it, this is going to be his 250th anniversary of his birth in 1770 now Beethoven was the sort of fascinating character, but one of his many qualities was not his charm. He he was a difficult, vindictive, complicated, bristly narcissist. Right? (laughs) He never got married. Big eyes. There's probably a lot of reasons why. (laughs) Now, back in the the Beethoven day. You know, they had obviously didn't have recordings, so everything had to be done live. And so, you know, composers like Beethoven not only made themselves famous by, you know, writing great pieces of music, but they also made them famous by doing fantastic things on stage themselves to show off their own personal virtuosity. Much in the same way as like we see sort of like, you know, musical duels in the in the, the modern era, like, you know, Buddy Rich and Gene Krupa with the jazz, you know, with the, the, the drum battles that they used to do. So back in the day, they would do you know, improvisational battles to sort of show off their prowess. Now, around this time when Beethoven was, I guess this is around the 1800s, very early in the 1800s, probably 1801 or two or three, right before Beethoven had written his third symphony, the Eroica Symphony, there came along this sort of upstart guy called Daniel Steibelt, who was sort of, you know, very flashy and uh, had acquired this this uh, reputation as being a fantastic improviser and he also had a had a wife who was very beautiful and played the tambourine and danced and so there was sort of a, a visual aspect to to Steibelt's performances and he made his way to Vienna where Beethoven was basically you know had sort of set up shop and this was his town and Beethoven was very put out that Steibelt was coming to basically eat his dinner and so Steibelt had had come and given this quintet performance with his that that uh, featured this very complicated cello bass line and so at the 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 court of one of the princes that was beethoven's chief sponsor i guess if you will steibold was invited to give a, a a piano improvisation and he did this by taking the cello part from his quintet and playing it on the piano just the, you know the first opening notes and then improvising on it in sort of a titanic way and, and uh, observers at the time suspected that he kind of not really improvised it but had actually planned the improvisation long in advance but nonetheless it was a spectacular feat and he got ra- you know rapturous applause from this so then it was Beethoven's turn to do this. And so Beethoven, you know, got up and he took the, the piece of piano of, of, uh, of the cello part that Steibolt had dismissively thrown on the floor because he was going to do it from memory because he was so good, you see. And he picked it up and he put it on the, on the piano music stand and then turned it upside down and then proceeded to improvise on the first several notes of, of the cello line played upside down and backwards. And then he improvised on that and blew everybody away. And so Steibelt, you know, reputedly never came back to Vienna and sort of slunk off with his tail between his legs because he was so humiliated by this and Beethoven really proved himself. But Beethoven, being a complicated, vindictive, uncompromising man, shall we say, was not yet finished with his revenge against Steibelt. And so when he wrote the Eroica Symphony, and I'm going to play this, uh, just a short excerpt. So I'll, I'll just describe to the audience what, what you're going to hear, first of all, which is this is the fourth movement, the final movement of the third symphony, the Eroica Symphony. And it starts with this fantastic sort of explosion of noise from the violins where they go, and there's a big sort of like climactic bravura of, of, of noise. And then it goes into this weird little dinky, 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 dinky sort of like insipid music, this sort of silly song, right? And the silly song, well, I'll just play it for you, and then I'll explain more. Great, right? It's fantastic. And then this. What the heck? It's a child song. Silly, intentionally silly. A 
Okay. Now, the interesting thing about this and the denouement to the story is that that silly song that he plays there is the opening phrase of the upside down and backwards cello line that he improvised on to humiliate Steibolt. And he wasn't finished just doing it live. He then wrote his third symphony based on that theme and spent the entire movement turning it into something unbelievable. It's sort of the, the sort of the ultimate, like, you think you're so great. Let me show you what great really looks like. Wow. Boy, that's, that's vindictive. <laughs> Yeah. And in fact, it, he, he had done it three times because he'd written two other compositions that kind of led up to this. So he wasn't he he, he like did it repeatedly. Uh-huh. And in fact, the, the theme, the sort of the dinky, 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 dinky sign is strung throughout the entire symphony, making one think that he probably wrote the fourth symphony last and then put it in a sequence as sort of like, the you know, the capstone. So and then he raised his and then he raised his eyebrows. And, then he raised his eyebrows. <laughs> and, and of course, the third symphony is a totally fantastic piece of work. So you know, but he, uh, sort of understanding the history behind that and the politics and the personalities, I think, just makes it that much more you know interesting to listen to. And we leave it up to Chris to tie together and a podcast on infectious diseases with Beethoven. Beethoven, whose well name derives from you know a family that apparently grew beets in oh, Lord. In, in Brussels. Well, there you Back go. Back to you, Matt. Well, that is the end of our program. But we do, before we go, want to thank our special guest. Thank you, Dean Galea, for joining us. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. So fun. And we also want to thank our live audience for joining us and for the fantastic questions that you had. If anyone has any feedback on this or any other episode, or you want to suggest a study or a topic for us to take on, you can tweet us at at PopHealthyX, or you can tweet me at at ProfMattFox, or Don at DThea1, or Chris at ID.Gill, but he doesn't check it. And you can also tweet Dean Galea at, at Sandro Galea. Or you can find us on the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthex.org. Remember that the Winter Institute is coming up, so head there to register. We want to thank Leslie Talali and Director of Lifelong Learning at the BU School of Public Health for supporting the podcast and Nick Guler for sound and editing. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it as part of our SPH 45 Public Health Now is the Time campaign, and we hope you will download our next episode. (laughs) 